Schwab Asset Management is proud to sponsor the Advisor Upside podcast with ETF.com. With bond market conditions looking upbeat for 2024, Schwab stands ready with a suite of low-cost fixed income ETFs. Learn more at schwabassetmanagement.com forward slash welcome dash ETFs. Welcome to the Advisor Upside Podcast, powered by ETF.com. I'm your host, Jeff Benjamin, and I'm talking today with Kaylee Cox, the brand new Chief Market Strategist at Ritholtz Wealth Management. Kaylee, how are you doing? Thanks for being here. Hi, Jeff. Good to be here. I'm fantastic, and I'm so excited to be a part of the Ritholtz team officially. Yeah, I know officially. That's key here. You just started there. Uh, we're, we're publishing this on June 18th, but you've started... I think you the official start date was what, June 17th, or that's when it was announced. Uh, Want to hear a little bit about your background and about what you're going to be doing there at Ritholtz? Yeah, well, let's talk about the elephant in the room, right? So mm-hmm. I'm officially Ritholtz's chief market strategist, and I'm so honored to be a part of what I think is one of the most innovative RIAs in the industry right now. Um, I've always admired Ritholtz's ability to talk to everyday people. Um, I've been in research for a little over 10 years. I started out as a reporter at Bloomberg uh, covering stocks and options. And, you know, I learned markets from some of the best strategists and storytellers within the industry. So, you know, I eventually became one of those people who learned to tell the story instead of asking Mm -hmm. other people what the story was about markets. I've admired Ritholtz for a while. Um, You know, Josh Brown has been one of the best in the game at telling investors how it is. And I've always told Josh and Michael Batnick that, you know, there's a way to deliver Wall Street quality risk research to everyday investors who, like you and me, are just trying to build wealth. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, they're not necessarily trading every day. They just want to retire with a nice nest egg and do it in an efficient manner. So, you know, I joined Ritholtz officially several days ago. I believe my first day was June 10th, if I remember. And, you know, at Ritholtz, I'm going to be the liaison between the investment committee and the advisors. I'm essentially the advisor's resident market nerd. I'll be building a content suite of timely market content uh, for advisors to use uh, to, you know, ultimately probably give to their clients. And, you know, I'm also going to build an evergreen content suite for them around behavioral finance and you know just how markets work over time. Okay. Well, looking forward to everything in front of you there at Ritholtz is a, obviously a highly regarded team. Josh, uh, I've known him for a long time. He's a great guy. He's always been good to uh to me, making himself accessible when I need uh when I need a big thinker. And uh but now I've got you, Kaylee. I'm I'm probably going to be bothering you more than more than you're you're ready for. So uh uh Hey, bother let's... away. Bother away. <laughs> I mean, everyday investors deserve somebody with a quality, a a quality voice on markets. And Josh has been the best at it uh, for about a decade now. Yeah. So I'm just honored to be joining a team that I think just provides such good quality content to the public. And I'm excited to, you know, add to their toolbox. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's let's talk about your your addition to the toolbox. I'm going to tap your uh, market strategist, chief market strategist expertise here. We're going to start with, uh, we're going to go down a list here. We're going to talk about some some current events and some interesting things and and outlooks. I want to start with the Fed rate cuts. Okay, they they met uh, last week. uh, The rates were left unchanged, which was expected. The market, I guess, liked that because there was a suggestion that there might be a cut this year. At the beginning of the year, we were talking about there was talk of six rate cuts. Then there was talk of none. Now there's talk of maybe two. What is your outlook for rate cuts and how do you see the Fed moving throughout the second half of the year? Well, Jeff, I think this is the hottest question in markets right now. And It's definitely a question that I'm getting from friends and family, and I'm sure our clients are asking advisors about it as well. Because if you think about it, interest rates are kind of the behavioral lever of how we view money. If interest rates are higher, uh, you're Mm -hmm. more incentivized to put your money in cash uh, because you're looking at higher deposit and CD rates. Um, You're a little more uh, trepidatious about taking on risk. Um, You're you know, maybe looking at more stable, profitable companies in the market. And we've seen that manifest itself over the past you know, year and a half or so since the Fed started hiking rates. So I think it's clear to say that the Fed's next move will probably be a rate cut. Um, 
that's that's a basic um, assumption that we can make going forward. And quite frankly, Jay Powell has said that. He said last week that, um, you know, the next move will likely be a cut. That's his words, not mine. But the big question is, and, you know, what a lot of investors of all kinds are wondering is when will we get that rate cut? You know, we're looking at interest rates at 5% right now. And that's put a lot of pressure on the economy. And add to that, that, you know, rate cuts don't have the best reputation, right? Um, the last time we saw rate cuts was in early 2020 during, you know, during the first days of COVID, which was a very tumultuous time for all of mm -hmm. us. But before that, we got rate cuts uh, during the financial crisis, which again, was a very tumultuous time for different reasons. So investors these days, you know, might feel a little bit wary about rate cuts, but at the same time, they're dealing with 7% mortgage rates. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk about recession and pressure on the economy and, you know, what could happen to the job market, along with some cracks that we're seeing in hiring and layoffs. Mm -hmm. uh, so you put it all together, you know, it looks like inflation, which was the crisis back in 2022, is, you know, coming under control. Uh, and this rate cut that we're going to get from the Fed, as long as the job market stays strong, it looks like it could be a good one. It looks like it could be a victory lap of sorts where the Fed says, you know, we've gotten close enough to achieving our uh, mandate, our little seesaw of inflation and employment that we feel OK letting off on the break uh, for the economy. And, you know, I think that's a good thing. I think that it requires you to think about your portfolio a little bit differently, obviously, your cash allotments uh, versus you know, how much you're invested in stocks and where you're invested. Uh, but I don't think advisors or investors need to be scared of cuts, nor do I think that they need to play this game of, you know, when exactly will the Fed cut rates? Rate cuts yeah. are coming. And as long as the economy looks strong, then you can think of rate cuts as a relief of sorts. Right. I think if you were going to be afraid of cuts, you would have uh, a lot of money in cash right now. But like you said, if there is a cut, it's not going to be huge. It's still going to make cash attractive. We're going to get to that in a minute. First, I want to talk about the, the stock market. Uh, it's a bull market in every sense of the word. The Nasdaq's up 20% this year. The S&P's up 14%. It still feels a little bit uh, precarious, I guess. Uh, like it's not one of these things everybody's uh, feeling like it's so strong. But I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on the market itself? Well, we're in a bull market, first and mm -hmm. foremost. Uh, I don't want to be a nerdy technician, but it does satisfy the definition of a bull market, it has, and it has for a while. Uh, but broadly, I mean, the S&P is up 50% since October 12th, 2022. Um, if you've missed a move like that, that's that's been an expensive mistake. So we're in a bull market, but it, like you said, it doesn't seem like a lot of people believe in it. And for very good reasons. There's a lot of uncertainty out there. And of course, uncertainty is the price you pay for investing. That's where you uh, implicitly get some return from. But, you know, that cloud of uncertainty feels a little bit thicker, Jeff. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're here. People are talking about a recession. Uh, prices keep pushing higher, even though, you know, the ground feels a little unstable. And now we're here in this weird bull market of sorts where people are holding on to cash, where not all stocks are participating in it. But you know, if you look at the broader market, it's up quite a bit. So the big question is, where do we go from here? And I like to keep it simple, as does Ritholtz. Uh, you know, first of all, it's very expensive to miss a bull market if you're a longer term investor. Bulls, on average, uh, since 1950, have lasted over five years in length. And typically, they've, or on average, they've provided about 20% in gains annually. Um you have to be you have to participate in the stock market to build wealth over time. So if you don't believe in this bull market, it's expensive to fight it. It's tough mm -hmm. to fight a bull. Yeah, it is. It is. But it's less expensive than maybe it has been in past bull markets because of the Fed's rate policy. We obviously we know there's a lot of money sitting in cash in the sidelines. I've talked to a lot of financial advisors saying they're, they're trying to figure out when to get these these cash heavy clients into something else if we're heading toward a rate cut cycle it's hard to say what that could look like but if rates are cut value of cash goes down what are your thoughts on that i i loved how you said you you shouldn't be missing this bull market but 
where should people be? What should people be thinking about that have a lot of cash right now? It's funny that you brought up that comment for financial advisors. You know, when should we rotate out of cash in the markets, mm -hmm. knowing that this yield on cash is going to go down? My answer to that is, why not now? We know rate cuts are coming. Um, we mm -hmm. know the value of cash or the the incentives of staying in cash are declining mm -hmm. by the day. Uh, and there's still a lot of value left in the stock market. Um, on one hand, this rally has been really thin. It's been driven by tech stocks. But mm -hmm. if you flip that and look at the benefit of a thin rally, there's a lot of value in this market. And we could realize some of that value once we get those rate cuts, because quite frankly, yields are what are restraining a lot of sectors in the stock market. I mean, if you think about it, the cheapest sectors that you can look at are, um, you know, banks for one, uh, very rate sensitive. Uh, we think that there's value in housing, uh, both in residential and then, you know, probably some of the commercial REITs as well. Uh, but that's a rate play too. Um, a lot of smaller speculative stocks um, haven't quite recovered from their losses in 2022. Um, you know, this is a weird bull market. Um, there isn't a lot of belief there. And you can see that in sector valuations and in, uh, you know, the this jagged performance um, mm -hmm. that we've seen in different pockets of the market. So see that as an opportunity and understand that, you know, right now the job market is quite strong and it's hard to see a bear market come upon us unless we see a serious crack in the job market. I mean, after all, people spend money when they are making money and a lot of Americans' primary income comes from their jobs. 70% of US GDP is consumer spending. Um, I don't think it's that simple, uh, but that is, and of course, I don't think that rule of thumbs ever exists, but I think that that is as foundational as you can get when it comes to understanding why markets work the way they do. Mm -hmm. Market concentration. You referenced this a, a couple of times since we've been talking. I'm talking about the Magnificent Seven and whatever else. Maybe that number, that, that group is smaller now, but it really is a, a, a handful of technology names that are driving much of the market performance. What What do you think about that market concentration? Is that just a giant mountain of risk or what? Well, it's painful. I think we mm -hmm. can say that right out of the gate. Uh, a lot of investors, especially ones that lean on certain sectors over others, don't believe in the bull market and they don't believe it for a reason. They're not seeing mm -hmm. it in their portfolios. Uh, a concentrated market isn't something to be scared of. Uh, it's painful, but it's not necessarily this harbinger of a bubble that's coming. You know, I think people are a little too stuck in the analogy of 1999 and 2000. Mm -hmm. Uh, when they look at, you know, Apple, NVIDIA, and uh, you know, right. Microsoft's of the world. These are big companies with stable balance sheets and huge competitive moats. And quite frankly, they look a little more defensive. Now, this is a blanket statement. I'm not saying every one of the MAG7 looks defensive, but you have to understand the fundamental strength of these companies and the undertones of the AI story that investors are trying to parse through now. There's a very good reason that people are favoring tech stocks and they're not looking at other stocks uh, because of higher yields and this discretion you have to have when uh, you know rates are a little bit higher and cash is attractive. So I'm going to throw a stat at you. This year, over 70% of the S&P 500 constituents are underperforming the S&P 500. That's a huge gap of performance. And we actually saw that last year as well, Jeff. Right. And you can look at it both ways. Um, you know, a lot of people point to that and say a bubble is coming. But, you know, I think that this is the bull market still in its early, early innings. And part of the reason why performance has been constrained is because investors are having to contend with higher rates. So I read that as a reason to get invested now, especially in the sectors that have been constrained, because we know that rates are coming down. You know, I don't see this as an obstacle for the market. I see this as natural. I see this as a fundamental story. And, you know, I see it as something that could eventually broaden out, especially if you believe earnings and the the encouraging projections that we've seen in earnings estimates. Let's go to the final question here. Taylor Swift's impact on the economy. I, I got to hear you break this down for me. All right. So I have to admit right out of the gate, I'm a Swifty. I saw Taylor Swift in Madrid a few weeks ago. Um, she's incredible, like everybody says. Uh, but I think that Taylor Swift's uh, success these past two years, and I'm talking about the Eras Tour people, 
um, you know, Taylor Swift's success and just the incredible reception that the Eras tour has gotten is really symbolic when it comes to thinking about a the strength of the consumer, but b what consumers are spending their money on. Um, so it's a funny mix of factors. I mean, first of all, we're a few years out of the COVID restrictions. I, I think that we're still seeing some pent up demand there, where people are just really stretching their wings and um, you know diving into experiences and spending money on travel and going to Europe and um, you know just really living their lives lives. But you know, one of the groups that we've seen uh, do the best in this um, you know COVID recovery of sorts, especially in the job market, has been younger consumers, younger investors, millennials and Gen Z. And that's a blanket statement. Um, you know, I know that a lot of people are struggling in this economy and inflation is, uh, inflation while it, it's coming under control is still something the economy is recovering from. But I mean, just the insane reception that we've seen for Taylor Swift and for other tours as well, like Beyonce's tour, you know, I called it out last year. You know, it's really hard to have a recession when you see when you see so much money being spent on concerts, for example, and, you know, events, um, especially when you consider, again, that consumers are 70% of the U.S. economy. Um, you know, of course, we've seen that pop up in inflation and, you know, services inflation, inflation on airfare, inflation on insurance, inflation on concert tickets has been the type of, you know, persistent inflation that the Fed has tried to control. Uh, but, you know, if you're worried about the economy, I'd say one of the first uh, kind of one of the first symbols you can look at is, you know, how receptive people are to going to concerts, mm -hmm. like the Eras tour, for example. And, you know, let me tell you, this is anecdata through and through, but I went to the Eras tour and tour in Madrid, and there were so many Americans there, you know, so many, you know, younger consumers going to see Taylor. And, you know, I put that narrative up against, um, you know, consumers not doing well any day because, you know, quite frankly, concert tickets are the first to go on a budget if you're cutting your budget. And it seems like for a lot of people, that just isn't the case. All right. Well, we will keep an eye on that, on Taylor Swift. And we'll also keep an eye on you, Kaylee, see with uh, what you develop there at uh, Ritholtz and uh, all the great stuff you're probably going to be putting out uh, in short order. I'm sure they're going to keep you busy. I want to thank you for joining us and uh, we'll we'll be in touch. All right. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Jeff. This was a lot of fun. All right, folks. Thanks for listening to another episode of Advisor Upside. I want to thank our guest, Kaylee Cox of Ritholtz Wealth Management. I want to thank our sponsor, Schwab Asset Management. And I want to thank you folks for listening. Uh, I want to encourage you to head over to ETF.com for more podcasts, more videos, more news stories, pretty much everything you need. Uh, if you want to reach out to me, I'm at jeff.benjamin at etf.com. Give me a shout. Let me know what you want to hear me talk about or write about, or if you want to be a guest. Also, you can find me on Twitter or X. Uh, and my handle is at Benji Writer. And uh, looking forward to hearing more from everyone. Thanks a lot. Schwab Asset Management is proud to sponsor the Advisor Upside podcast with ETF.com. With bond market conditions looking upbeat for 2024, Schwab stands ready with a suite of low-cost fixed income ETFs. Learn more at schwabassetmanagement.com forward slash welcome dash ETFs.